King's Indian defense has done it again. What do I mean by that? Let me show you. This is a game that I played a few days ago, just online, against my 2100 rated opponent. And since he goes for the English, I play the King's Indian defense. Hence the video, thumbnail, title, etc. I wasn't going to play like a Karo. I can't play a Karo against C4. Although I do love the Karo. Um, if you haven't seen any of my Karo videos, go have a look. The Karo can is actually pretty exciting sometimes. Um, anyway, my opponent goes for a Fianchetto setup, which I find really boring. And one of the ways that I like to counter it is often by using C6 to blunt the scope of the bishop. Um, and then trying to play either in the center or go for some queenside expansion with a6 and b5. b5 in two moves, not one. The arrows aren't working properly. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I set up this classic King's Indian structure with the Fianchetto bishop, the knight on f6, and castling. My opponent plays b4, and I play d6, preparing pawn to e5, because pawn c5 is possible. But like I said before, I like c6 in a lot of these variations to blunt the bishop. But here my opponent goes e4, which means c5 is a bit more viable because the dag the bishop's diagonal isn't actually open anymore because the pawn has closed it down. But I go for e5, and the reason why I really like e5 is because now my opponent's put a pawn on e4. As long as I can maintain a pawn on e5... This pawn is never moving, and therefore the diagonal is never opened. So I don't actually have to go c6 anymore. But also, 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 the only real way to get this pawn moving is for me to play f5 and allow my opponent to take. My opponent can go for f4, but as long as I support the pawn, I can maintain it there, right? And the e4 pawn is stuck. But it gives me control over when the diagonal opens with f5, which you'll see later is important. So instead of taking, my opponent closes the center up with d5. I go knight bd7, just developing. I've got ideas to maybe come to... Oh my god. To c5, potentially. My opponent develops. He puts his knight on e2 rather than f3. Because on f3, it isn't really doing anything. There's no D pawn to support because the pawn's on D5. And the... Oh my god. And the E5 pawn is very well defended. So instead he puts a knight on E2 to support an F4 an F4 pawn push to try and dislodge my pawn like I mentioned before. Here, I kind of have an ideal King's Indian setup. So I play knight h5, which is actually the computer's one of its top choices. The point is that I want to play pawn f5. Like I said before, I control when this diagonal gets opened up. But now there's a pawn on d5. Even if the e pawn moves, the diagonal is still blocked off by this pawn. So I don't have to worry about that. Right? I don't have to worry about letting the e4 pawn take. Because the d5 pawn still blocks the diagonal. Also, in a lot of King's Indian positions, the bishop goes to e2, which makes knight h5 a bit more risky, because the bishop could take it. But with a knight on e2 blocking the queen's vision of my knight... Jesus! Blocking the queen's vision of my knight, it's kind of safe to put it on h5. It also exerts a bit of pressure on f4 if my opponent tries to push this pawn up. So my opponent goes bishop to e3, just developing, and I go f5 as planned. And here my opponent takes, I take back with the g-pawn. Again, my knight is in vision of the queen, but this knight can't go anywhere useful. Because if it goes to d4 or to f4, I can take and threaten the bishop or the knight. So I would win a piece. The, the knight can go to b1 to open up an attack on my knight, but then I'll just drop it back. Or maybe support it with the other knight. Here my opponent plays pawn to f4. 
And I want to play E5 to block this, uh, to open up the diagonal for my bishop. But I was worried about knight to d4, opening up an attack on my knight with the queen and getting this knight to e6. I was really worried about this, like this position. And here I have to give up uh, the exchange. So I bring my knight back instead. And if my opponent takes me, I was, I was probably going to take back with the pawn because... The computer prefers taking back with the knight, but this pawn is now really weak, and I can never advance it to f4 because it's controlled by so many pieces. But my opponent says castles. Then I play knight to g4, attacking the undefended bishop. He defends the bishop, and then I take it. And I was really happy. I was so happy here. Because after the exchange, I get e4. And this knight can jump into the center, which it does, but I have a dark squared bishop, and my opponent doesn't have a dark squared bishop. I actually released a video, I think a couple of days ago, where I went over a tournament game in which I sacrificed the exchange, right? I sacrificed a rook for my opponent's dark squared bishop, because it left me with a dark squared bishop, again in a King's Indian structure. And with no rival to this bishop, it dominates this diagonal, which now has four of white's pieces on it, making it quite an important diagonal. And the fact that I have a protected passed pawn on e4, which is well blockaded for now, but that could change. Here, I should have gone knight c5. I was worried about b4, and after my knight was jump jumped in, for some reason, I didn't like this. I thought the knight was vulnerable to getting um, surrounded with like rook d1, bishop f1, and my knight would have no retreat, and I'd have to give up this pawn. So instead, I go knight b6, which opens this bishop's control of e6, so the knight can't jump in, which is why I need to move the knight somewhere. And it threatens c4, which forces pawn b3 giving me another tempo and further weakening this diagonal. So I go a5. a5 looks like a strange move, but the idea is to go a4 because I want to try and break apart this structure a bit, which, you know, given my bishop's pressure on the diagonal, I could get a monopoly over the a file with my rook if, you know, this pawn gets traded off and this rook's forced to move because of my bishop's pressure on it. So that was my idea with a5. My opponent jumps in with knight c to b5. And here I just play a bad move. Because I want to move my queen, but I can't because this pawn hangs. Uh, I probably should have just gone a4. But here I go c6. And in my head I was like, this, this knight can't move because it's pinned to the rook like that the arrows don't want to work for me so it can't take but of course it can take because it comes with an attack on the queen so i can't take the rook because then my queen hangs so i go queen to d7 um which is an ugly looking move my opponent retreats and then i go a4 so i'm down a pawn i've got a weak d6 pawn but the strengths of my position are my queenside pressure. This a pawn is doing a great job. I could potentially play d5 at some point. This bishop is very strong. And I've got my protected passed pawn, which really weakens this bishop. Like the computer is suggesting bringing the bishop to h3 just so it's doing something useful. So my opponent plays rook b1. I take, take, opening up the a file. And I throw my rook onto a7. My opponent plays rook f2. And I take it. And I really want him to take with the queen. Which he does. Because this pawn is now no longer blockaded. I can't advance it. Because I would just lose a pawn. Right? But in the future. I might be able to. Now the queen's moved. I go bishop b7. 
you know, I've got ideas of some discovered attack on the bishop after I move my pawn to attack the queen. It doesn't work, but it just sets up ideas for tactics in the future, right? And that's that that that's how you get positions where you can win tactically by setting up potential like tactical motifs through moves like this. It's just, you know, there's nothing concrete, but it's a good square for my bishop, and it could lead to tactics in the future, right? That can't be a bad thing. My opponent now moves his rook, which does pin this knight, which is worth noting. I go rook e8, because I want to prepare pawn to e3. The computer hates it. Uh, again, the computer is screaming for bishop to h3 to try and get the bishop in the game, because it is just dead right now but my opponent infiltrates a rook a7 which looks like a scary move but there is one move in this position to try and fight which is knight to c8 and knight c8 looks horrible sure i attack the rook and the rook's forced to move and then my bishop is no longer pinned but my knight's on c8 it's not actually as bad as you'd imagine, because on b6, it was kind of just staring at nothing, right? It was staring at nothing anyway. On c8, it kind of controls this knight by, okay, sorry, by defending the d6 pawn, which allows my queen to go wherever she wants, and like I said, forces the rook out. So even though it looks ugly, it's actually quite effective. And here, I play pawn e3. I attack the queen. The queen moves. And I, I trade bishops. Can't take with the queen because I might just be able to push. Okay, the computer's coming up with some wild lines off of the fact that the queen is overloaded. But my opponent takes with the king so that the queen maintains her blockade of the pawn. Here I give a check on b2, b7, sorry, just because this diagonal is better for the queen. So I don't just give the check for the sake of the check. I give the check because I want my queen to get into the game. Sure, I could maneuver it, maneuver it through e7 and up to e4, but if I go through b7, I gain time and I get to b, I, I, I get to e4, and that's the only way I can really get my queen into the game. Here, I'm threatening to take the knight. The computer finds c5, which is a great move, because it means that the rook now defends. Uh, although, oh wow, it's actually this in this position. That is crazy. And giving up the queen. Okay, fair play, fair play. <laughs> My opponent actually just fully blunders. And goes rook to a8. Here, I can take this rook, but I decide to instead take the knight because I figured that the knights were more useful than the rook. And my opponent then takes on c8. And sorry, just to elaborate a bit further, if I take this rook, obviously I'm completely winning. But I do give this pawn up. And the knights do kind of a good job in the center. Obviously, I am completely winning. I'm up a rook. But I thought it would be more clinical to take the knight. My opponent inexplicably, well, not inexplicably, he takes on c8 to set up this fork, but misses queen to b1 check. So I can actually save my rook because my queen gets to escape with a tempo on the king. Then I put my rook on a8, threatening rook to a2, pinning the queen to the king. So my opponent jumps in. And here it is actually kind of scary, because my opponent has got potential checks, and the knight and the queen are a fantastic attacking combo. So I have got to be a little bit careful. But here I calculate rook a2. I expect queen here. I give a check here. And I actually, in the game, I actually saw uh, bishop f6 because I saw it forced my opponent to give up the queen. 
computer says it's better to do it like this, which I'm sure it is. But this is what I saw in the game, and I was like, okay, that's completely winning. Um, and after rook here check, if the king goes to f3, which he does in the game, then I play queen to f1, checkmate. The pawn cuts the king's escape off, which is really important because, you know, this queen and knight actually do pose a danger to my king. Like, if I play a nothing move here, then this is mate. So I do actually have to be a bit clinical. But my opponent makes it easy for me by going to f1. Uh, f3, sorry. Queen f1 is mate. And that's the game. The king's Indian does it again. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you stuck around till the end, please drop a like, subscribe, comment any type of videos you want to see in the future. With that, have a good one.